Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'm going to talk about finding maximums and minimums on a surface. Um, the example I'm going to start with is some surface f of xy is equal to x cubed plus y cubed minus 3x minus 3y. Now we've actually seen this surface in a previous video. We already computed the gradient vector for this equation. We got 3x squared minus 3 comma 3y squared minus 3. And my job in this problem is to find all local maxes and mins on the surface. I want this point on the upper left, this point on the lower right, and actually along the way we'll also end up finding some interesting points that are neither maxes nor mins called saddle points. So we'll find some of those as well. All right, so how do we, how do we identify the places where we might have a local max or min? Well, we previously had a theorem that said that the candidates for local extrema are the places where the gradient vector is equal to zero, zero. Notice that I said candidates here. Um, we'll get some points that may be maxes or mins, but we have to do more investigation to figure out um, if they really are, uh, it really do represent a max or a min or neither. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my equation for the gradient vector and set that equal to 0, 0, equal to the 0 vector. And I'm going to solve the two resulting equations that I get. 3x squared minus 3 is equal to 0. That has a solution of x equals plus or minus 1 and 3y squared minus 3 is equal to 0, uh, which also has an equation, or also has a solution, I'm sorry, of y equals plus or minus 1. Now, if you put that all together, you get four candidates, four critical points, 1, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1. And I need to investigate further to figure out what's happening um, at those four critical points. Now, a common question that I get is, why are we setting the gradient vector equal to 0, 0? Why does that give us our candidates for places where we might have a local max or min? But what you need to remember is the way that we defined the gradient vector was based on the slope of a tangent plane. And you know that the places where you have a local max or min, at least for a differentiable surface, are the places where your tangent plane is perfectly horizontal. Well, a horizontal tangent plane, z equals f of a comma b, um, the only way that we're going to get a tangent plane with that equation is if the partial derivative of f with respect to x and the partial derivative of f with respect to y are both equal to 0 if the gradient vector is equal to 0, 0. And you can see that by comparing this horizontal tangent plane with the equation for the general equation for a tangent plane. The only way we're going to get this horizontal tangent plane is if we have these partial derivatives here equal to 0, 0. Um, so that's a good way of explaining why uh, the places where the gradient of f is equal to 0, 0 are also our candidates for local extrema. All right, so let's figure out how to classify these critical points. Uh, if you have technology at your fingertips, you could use all sorts of plotting tools to try to figure this out. So for example, a contour plot is pretty good. Um, now, these points are interesting. They're called saddle points because we go uphill in a pair of directions and we go downhill in other directions. And so these are not extrema. They're interesting points, um, and it's kind of neat finding saddle points on a surface, but they're, they're not maximums and they're not minimums uh, because they go uphill in, in some direction and they go downhill in another direction. Um, you could certainly look at this surface and see what's going on uphill in one direction and downhill in the other direction. Kind of looks like a saddle, hence the name saddle point. Um, there is an analogy to a saddle point um, that you might remember from single variable calculus. So here's a curve that um, has a point with a horizontal tangent line that is neither a maximum nor a minimum, right? It's not a max, it's not a min, but it does have a horizontal tangent line. Well, this actually is called a, a saddle point. Um, you guys didn't call it a saddle point in your Calc BC class, but it is a saddle point. So anyway, um, a saddle point is still a place where you have a horizontal tangent plane, but it's neither a max nor a min. So we have two candidates left. Uh, we have one comma one, and we have negative 1, negative 1. And uh, we could have classified those in our 
previous contour plot by kind of looking at the colors and seeing where it looked like we had deeper water versus shallower water. That's kind of hard to read based on a color scheme. And so I think it's actually a little bit easier to read a gradient vector field because we could see what our compass readings are telling us. For example, we have a point down here at negative one, negative one, where if we draw a small neighborhood around that point, we could see all the gradient vectors are pointing in towards that point. Well, what is that telling us? It's telling us that our compass readings are saying, hey, go over here, go over here. The direction of greatest initial increase on our surface is in this direction. Well, if all of our gradient vectors in a neighborhood like this are, are saying to go towards this point, um, we could kind of surmise that this is going to be a local maximum. So we have a local maximum at 1 comma negative 1. Similarly, if we look in the upper right, those points are telling us go away. If you want to go in the direction of greatest initial increase, get away from this orange point. Well, that's going to be a local minimum because if our gradient compass is saying the direction of greatest initial increase is away from this point, then that's going to be a local minimum. And then we can see that saddle points have gradient vectors that are both flowing in and out because we can go uphill uh, in certain directions and downhill in others. And that's what a saddle point does. So we've classified our maxes and mins. Uh, we've got our local maximum at negative one, negative one, our local minimum at one comma one, and we do have our two saddle points, which are very interesting as well, even if they're not extreme values. Okay, so um, you might wonder, like, hey, I'm not always going to have Mathematica at my fingertips, right? I'm not always going to be able to produce a contour plot and a gradient vector field to classify, um, you know, any any particular candidates that I have for maxes and mins on the surface. So how am I going to do this if I don't have Mathematica to help? Well, the way we do it is by generalizing the second derivative test. Um, you guys might remember the second derivative test from your Calc BC class. Basically, if we have a candidate, if we have a place where we might have a max or a min, if the second derivative is negative at that point, we have a local maximum. And the way you are supposed to kind of imagine that it kind of looks like an upside down parabola, right? Um, so we have a horizontal tangent, and the second derivative is negative, so we're concave down. Well, concave down with one of our candidates would be a local max. Similarly, if our second derivative is positive, well, we're going to have a local minimum because we have a horizontal tangent, and the curve is going to be concave up at that point, so that looks like a minimum. And then uh, it is possible for our test to be inconclusive. If the second derivative is zero, we need to find another technique. So anyway, here's an example that's similar to something you would have seen in your Calc BC class. And you could see that I was able to classify a local minimum, a local maximum, and this saddle point here, the test ends up coming in inconclusive, which will happen in for the new second derivative test I'm about to teach you guys as well, um, we do have the possibility of an inconclusive test depending on the behavior of our surface at certain points. Okay, so the reason that this is more complicated in multivariable calculus is that um, the second partial derivative test, quote unquote, uh, has more than one variable to worry about, right? We can't just be concave down in the x direction, but we also have to be concave down in the y direction. To have a maximum, we need both the x direction and the y direction to be concave down. Uh, otherwise, we might end up with saddle point, right? If we're not careful, if we're uphill in one direction and downhill in, in another direction, we don't have a max, we don't have a min, we have a saddle point. So we need to basically check, is there agreement between the concavity in the x direction and the concavity in the y direction. And if there is, if we get agreement in those two directions and we can figure out if we're concave up or concave down there, we can classify a min or a max. So a fundamentally more complicated test, but it's still very related to the second derivative test that you learned last year. Okay, so the way that we do this is we write something called the Hessian matrix. Um, remember that we need to look at the second derivative both in the x direction and in the y direction. And technically, 
uh, we do have mixing here too, right? We could take a second, there's basically four ways that say could take a second derivative in a multivariable calculus class, right? Um, so when you guys were in your Calc BC class, you didn't have a lot of choices. This second derivative was just d dx of d dx of f. And that there was only one way to take a second derivative. Well, now in a multivariable calculus class, um, we, ha we can choose here for our second derivative, right? Do we do x first and then y, or y first and then x, or two partial derivatives with respect to x, or two partial derivatives with respect to y? Well, the Hessian matrix has all four of them. All four ways that we could take a partial derivative, um, we're going to encapsulate that in our Hessian matrix. Here, and I can unpack one of these just if you're curious how this notation works. So let me take out one of these terms and it just goes in the order that you see it. So I have um, d dy of f, and then after that I'll do d, d, uh, d dx of that result. Well, if you want to write this a little bit more efficiently, d times d is kind of like d squared, and then I have a dx and a dy, so you could see that in the denominator there. So this is all four ways we could take a second derivative in a multivariable calculus course. That's what the Hessian has. Now, if we take the determinant of that two by two matrix, that's called the Hessian determinant. And that Hessian determinant is gonna give us information about whether we have a local maximum, a local minimum, a saddle point, or whether our test is gonna come up as inconclusive. And the way that I think when I try to imagine how this determinant is working, um, you kind of think about it as whether um, the second derivatives agree with each other. So if the, the second derivative in the x direction and the second derivative in the y direction agree with each other, our determinant is going to come up positive. Whether you have a max or a min, there's agreement in both the x and the y direction. Um, a max and a min share the property that in the x direction and the y direction, um, the concavity agrees. So this would be for a maximum. For a minimum, it would look a little more like this. But either way, this Hessian determinant, when it's positive, it tells us that the, the, second, the concavity in the x direction and the concavity in the y direction kind of agree with each other. And then if you get a negative for that determinant, there's kind of disagreement between those derivatives, that would be a saddle point. Okay, well, this Hessian determinant is not enough to tell us if, we're, if we have a max or a min. It's just good enough to tell us if we agree with our concavity in the x direction and our concavity in the y direction. So what we do next is we say, okay, well, now that we know that, we, that our concavity is the same in the x direction and in the y direction, all we really need to do next is take one of our second derivatives. Um, this is just fancy notation for d squared f dx squared here, the second derivative, the second partial derivative of f with respect to x. And we're just going to calculate, we're just going to plug in our point. And if we get a negative, well, that means that we're concave down. This Hessian determinant tells us we're concave down in both directions. And so we have a local maximum. Um, if this second derivative ends up positive, we're concave up in the x direction, and then because the Hessian determinant was positive, it means we're concave up in both directions, and so we have a local minimum. And then if the uh, determinant is negative, you could stop there because if the determinant is negative, there's no reason to do any more calculation. We've got a saddle point. And then if your Hessian determinant ends up as zero, can't really use the second derivative test here. Uh, the test comes up inconclusive. Now, I'm, I'm kind of bending the truth a little bit here with how I'm explaining this. Um, really, if you want to see where the Hessian determinant comes in, you would look at uh, basically series expansions for your function, the same way that you had Taylor series that you were working with in your Calc BC class, and there was a relationship between um, the, the degree two term in your Taylor series expansion and the second derivative. Similarly here, um, you're gonna see this 
Hessian determinant kind of popping up in the series expansion for f of x, y. However, that goes beyond the scope of this course, and I, I don't think that uh, explaining that actually enlightens students very much. So I think the intuition I kind of explained here might help you a little bit more. Um, when the determinant is positive, that means that we have um, an agreement in our concavity in both directions, and that's going to help us figure out if we have a local max or local min. All right, so let, let's use this, um, this table here. So by the way, everything that you see here explains what I was just talking about with agreement with our concavity or disagreement with our concavity. So let's just take this table and see if we can crunch some numbers. So let's take the problem that we already did using a gradient vector field, and now let's try it again using the Hessian determinant to figure out where we've got maxes and mins and saddles. All right, so um, this is a bit of a pain, but I need to take my equation for my surface, and I need to compute all possible second derivatives. Now, it's not as bad as it looks because I actually showed a little bit of extra work here. Um, I have d dx of d dx of my original surface. Well, wait a minute. I already computed the gradient vector, and my gradient vector is df dx comma df dy. I'm already halfway there towards a, uh, towards a second derivative, right? Like I've already computed both of my first partial derivatives. I know that df dx is 3x squared minus 3. So you can go straight to this step because to get your second derivative, now just d dx that and you get 6x. Similarly, uh, to get the second partial derivative of f with respect to y, we already know that df dy is 3y squared minus 3, so you can go straight to this step, and if you d dy that, you get 6y. And then there's another interesting thing, which is um, technically in this matrix here, one of these uh, partial derivatives, or one of these second derivatives does d dy first and then d dx, and then the other one does d dx first and then d dy. Well, for the type of functions we work with in this course, um, the functions don't really care whether you take their partial derivative with respect to y first or with respect to x first. So typically this diagonal, for all the kinds of functions we're going to be working with, that diagonal is going to be the same. And so uh, when you do one of those calculations, the other one is going to end up being the same. Well, you guys can see here, uh, d dx of 3y squared minus 3. This is a partial derivative with respect to x on a function that doesn't have any x's. This function is constant relative to x. We get 0. And our entire diagonal then will end up as zeros because we're going to have the same phenomenon when we d dy 3x squared minus 3. So anyway, long story short, we get this Hessian determinant of 36xy. And that determinant is going to help us figure out whether we have agreement in our concavity, which will help us figure out if we have a local max, a local min, a saddle, or something that we can't classify using this test. Okay, so here's a summary of what we just computed. Our Hessian determinant is 36xy. And now you just kind of make a table, right? Um, I know that if I have 36xy and I plug in you know, I, don't know, I could plug in negative 1, negative 1 here. Well, that would be 36 times negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 36. And then you would look at your table and you'd say, um, okay, wait, my determinant is positive. Okay, so I know I don't have a saddle point, and I know this test is not going to come up inconclusive. I either have a max or a min um, because I have agreement in my concavity in both directions. And so either local max or local min, well, how do I figure out which one it is? Well, I, I don't know. I need to plug into one of my second derivatives and see if I'm concave up or concave down. So here, this part of the table says f, x, x, a, b. Oh, the second derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at a comma b. Wait, that's this entry from my matrix. For this problem, this is just 6x. And so I have to just plug in my x value that I'm looking at, so 6 times negative 1, which is going to be less than 0, which is going to be negative. Oh, 
I have a local maximum at the point negative one, negative one. And you would do that for all four candidates till you've classified your local mins, your local maximums, and your saddle points. So you could see the work right here at uh, one comma one. So my determinant was positive. My second derivative with respect to x was positive. Okay, so I'm concave up, and so concave up would give me a minimum, just like I was expecting, a local minimum at 1 comma 1. So we found our maximum, we found our minimum, here's our, um, here's our maximum again, and let's see what happens for our saddle point, or for either of our saddle points. When we plug 1 comma negative 1, into this Hessian determinant, we get a negative number. Um, since that is negative, we're at this point on the table, we've got a saddle point, and there's no more work to do. Don't compute any second derivatives. Once you hit no, you have a saddle point, you're done. It's a saddle point. And you're gonna get the same thing for your other saddle point. And now we've used the Hessian determinant as a second derivative test for classifying maxes and mins on surfaces. Uh, the good news here, you're not going to do this a ton. You might get a little bit of practice with it in some triad problems, a little bit on the quiz, but uh, overall this is not something that you see woven throughout the course. The gradient vector never goes away. Um, this second derivative test, that's a really cool thing to see once, um, but in my opinion it's kind of nicer to do in Mathematica than it is to do by hand just because there's a lot of computation. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Only one more video to go, and that's one of the more exciting ones, how to think in four-dimensional space.